Hello, I'm Sean Sherman, Security and Compliance Consultant, and I'm glad you're joining us today for this presentation on the Risk Management Framework, or RMF. As a synopsis for this presentation, we want to discuss and address a core problem of any organization to provide coordinated security and effective risk management. The risk management framework is a detailed process framework that the U.S. government has committed to to help address problems with coordination, communication, standardization, and much more. How is that possible? What's the big picture of this initiative? This presentation will try to align the objectives to practical advice on what to do next. So what is the RMF? Many people are still not quite sure what the RMF is, so here's a little background. The RMF first appeared in 2004 as NIST Special Publication 800-37, called A Guide for Applying Risk Management Framework to Federal Information Systems, a Life Cycle Approach. It describes a framework which supports a practical risk management approach and also describes a step-by-step -step approach to FISMA compliance, a process that was surprisingly successful after the first few years in moving federal civilian systems from highly insecure to secure. And the risk management framework documentation has a practical cycle approach which allowed for federal guidance to work with specific agency guidance, and that was a big part of its success. In 2009, the Joint Task Force Transformation Initiative, which is a working group between the DOD, the civilian agencies, the uh, supported by NIST, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, or ODNI, and the CNSS, which is the Committee on National Security Systems, got together and looked more closely at the RMF and determined that it really was the most appropriate framework to support other non-civilian organizations as well as the civilian side. The Joint Task Force consisted of enough of the agencies uh, in the DOD and in the intelligence community that they also saw that the process would support both national security systems and non-national security systems. In other words, the same guidance would work for both. The diagram on this slide illustrates how the Joint Task Force envisioned the RMF application to work for both sides in a way that also gave each agency or organization some ability to provide additional guidance to the practitioner. This diagram is the consistent illustration of the steps or stages of the risk management framework. For all government, the risk management framework describes a process that must be followed to secure, to authorize, and to manage IT systems. And you're going to see it in whatever primary documentation you look at, whether that's the DODI 8510.1, the NIST Special Publication 800-37, or the ICD-503. We won't go through each step in this presentation, but take a moment to look at it, and you'll notice that it's a logical workflow that defines a process cycle used for security protection of systems through the initiation of a project all the way through authority to operate and ongoing risk management. Each step of the RMF dictates specific activities and specific artifacts that will be generated towards appropriate documentation and certification of a system. For system admins and people like the ISSO, this provides consistent blueprints 
for maintaining a system or platform in a secure manner. And while all agencies use this diagram, there may also be organization-specific guidance used for specific types of systems based on the complexity or sensitivity of the information of a system. Here is another way to see the RMF steps. On this slide, you can see that the RMF references on specific steps are pretty extensive. If this is all new to you, for instance, if you've been supporting DIACAP or some other standard, you'll probably want to pay attention to some changes that have taken place. For DOD, the primary comment most heard is that the standard control sets that are referenced here in NIST 853 are significantly more detailed and extensive than the legacy 8500.2 controls. We went from about 100 or so to over 1300 controls. But if 85, or sorry, if the 853 is a newer document, it does address things that the older documents did not. It, it covers more technology and it covers overlapping requirements that you still had to address in the older DOD guidance, such as the 5200 series. There is, of course, no change to basic hardening instructions, for instance, the STIGs, nor to approaches to security, such as least privilege models. And certainly, we don't want anybody to give up solid, secure engineering practices. The noted focus in 800-53, which you'll see referenced on many steps, is that they're focusing on management, traceability, documentation, continuity of operations, and continuous monitoring, and application security. These were all holes in earlier and other older versions of compliance documentation. Change to essential security and compliance practices is often doubted. But to be clear, all systems are expected to migrate to the same ATO process. Department of Defense received orders in mid and late 2016 to this effect, and the Intel community is being required to adapt legacy systems to support ICD-503 and 837 processes. It's recommended that you really see this as evolutionary. You want guidance to be current to reflect modern technology and to reflect current risk. Technology changes very fast and really the risk management framework is a better model than the legacy systems. Of course, we, we do recognize that within that flexibility comes other challenges. For instance, a lot of the wording in the RMF is much looser and open to interpretation. And a lot of the defined timelines for working within this framework are open as well. For instance, in DIACAP, recovery timeline for a sensitive system might be marked as testable within 96 hours, but in the RMF, a recovery requirement is, quote, sufficient to meet system objectives, which could mean it, it might be done in a week, it might be done over the period of a month. So while transition is an evolutionary process, this particular framework is also open to new interpretations. So you should be asking yourself why. Why should this initiative 
be rolled out across the entire government. I think that speaks to these four points. The first one is standards, right? This is the the standard of control. It's the standard of language in which we, when we're talking about, for instance, change control or hardening standards um, or access controls in the DOD, we're talking the same language, the same type of control in the Department of Agriculture or the um, CIA. So that similarity means that sensitivity means the same thing. If I call this system classified or um, highly sensitive, it means the same thing for different parts of the federal government. And that, surprisingly enough, is an enormous value to the RMF. And you can see that particularly in this concept of reciprocity. This is where one agency or organization agrees to the certification and security measures as being sufficient on a system in another organization or agency. And this allows for better communication and joint participation in large systems so that one agency can jointly connect to another agency or or there's the possibility of connection with that other agency because of this concept of reciprocity. And reciprocity, of course, is not a rubber stamp. Um, there's still instruction and expectation that each agency will still have to assess risk in its own, you know, from its own point of view. But RMF guides an acceptance process and focuses on the reuse of control information, control tailoring and overlays so that you have a common language between agencies. Second point is a focus on risk or risk management, not the traditional model of assessment checklists. And the value of risk management is, of course, that systems holding sensitive information are appropriately protected based on that information. You cannot doubt that national security information or privacy, PII, HIPAA type information or citizen or warfighter information is at the same level of sensitivity as, for instance, environmental statistics or unclassified report data. And so what this system allows or what this framework allows is that systems are appropriately classified based on that risk assessment process. And thirdly, security is considered earlier in the process of setting up a new system. This, this would be true in the case of acquiring a new system or building a new system from scratch or working on, for instance, merging or having a, a reciprocal arrangement between agencies wanting to share a system. The idea is, is that systems of higher sensitivity are not reversely discriminated against because of in, inappropriate assessment of the risk of that data. Um, for instance, do you really want a sensitive system to wait for three years before it's reassessed um, for risk? And I think the answer to that is, is obviously no. And finally, this, this process has introduced and really underscored the concept of continuous monitoring. This is, just like it sounds, an ability to constantly review the status of whether or not a control is working or not working, and whether or not the security profile of a system has changed. This is very clear at an individual system level. You, you wouldn't want to turn on a system and then never look at the logs um, for, for sake of, of being attacked or, or having some sort of critical failure. But this is also true at the larger enterprise level, whether that's enterprise as in an entire federal agency or organization, 
or the entire federal government. If, if there is a, a wish in the very probably long term here, it would be that an organization as large as the U.S. federal government would have some ability to roll up its security profile for all of its systems in a manner which would give us a better understanding of where our risks are and what systems might be at risk um, across the entire enterprise. And if there is data of similar type in, in different areas of the government, that a risk to one of those systems would be a risk to all of those systems by coordinated communication, which is the idea behind this continuous monitoring uh, module. The other thing to remember here is that changes in guidance um, are, are still expected. In other words, specific agencies and organizations may say, well, our, our level of sensitivity to this particular type of system or particular type of data is so high that, for instance, we will not be giving out a three-year ATO or even an 18-month ATO. Maybe this system has to be basically reaccredited um, at, at a much higher cadence, a much, much uh, quicker cadence than, than normal. And that would still be allowed. So who does this new RMF process affect? If you read the RMF, and we strongly recommend that you take some time to read either 800-37 or agency-specific guidance, which will be similar, it always describes a process which is often shown as a pyramid. In this particular diagram, I've shown it as, as connecting boxes, but the concept's exactly the same. From the bottom level to the top, there needs to be communication of monitoring, of risk assessment, and so forth. And from the top level down, there needs to be constant communication of what are corporate strategies, what are corporate policies, what is the actual guidance um, being pressed down towards the operational level. This model works because it provides better risk assessment and risk guidance to an organization by taking into effect information at a governance level, which might be the CIO level, and it takes into effect information at the tactical or business model level, which might be the ISSO level or the authorizing official level, in which they're saying, no, no, this is a particular risk we need to make sure is worked into um, the risk management process. This particular model does leave open an obvious workflow challenge, which is that at the middle, at tier two in this particular model, the business management has to balance pressure from executive leadership or high-level leadership on what policies are being expected to be followed and from information coming up from systems management saying these are the threats or risks that are being uh, seen to come up with the most practical guidance. So what are the benefits of this model? In this slide, we try to illustrate some specific players who might be associated with the model. At the top row, we have, for instance, CIOs, executive level sponsors of systems, and what's the benefit of this model for them? I'd say the top issue is actually cost savings because the, the, the advantages of the model are to improve similarity of controls. Similar controls implies similar language and assessment of those controls, which gives the CIO the ability to see reuse of controls instead of special systems for special projects, for instance. Also, there's an advantage at this level to see that resources that are used 
to maintain risk and security are portable. A, a resource in one agency or one organization who is well adept at managing risk and security in this model should be able to be moved into another organization and be immediately effective. This should overall improve compliance for the organization. The next row, we have warfighters as an example, end users, what's in it for them? The benefit for an end user, it should be faster deployment. How fast can I take this application and put it into a, a system that I can use? That's ATO, that's authority to operate. And if the RMF is realized, then there should be greater assurance of security. There should be greater ability to share data between agencies and make, make systems interoperable, which would be a great benefit to an end user. The next row, business system owners, is the classic mid-tier of the RMF. What's in it for them? Consistency. Consistency of artifacts and efficiency of that program. And then at the bottom level, tier three in the RMF, I put down system developers. They are oftentimes the ones who are trying to put together a system, gather the requirements, work with all kinds of different players, what's in it for them. Standardization of control requirements should be probably number one on their list. They have a well-documented, well-understood list of requirements that would go with any system and the ability to modify those requirements based on the sensitivity of the data and the risk assessment process. So how do you start? We have tried to create a little storyboard for success on any organization that's just trying to get a handle on what the RMF means in terms of process and procedure and change to their organization. We recommend a pilot project to help figure out exactly what are the actual costs, what the actual changes are from your prior program to the new RMF program. Our first point would be to choose experts. In other words, choose senior people to work on a project, a pilot project. This will lend better assessment of both how the existing program works versus the new RMF and also what the actual impacts will be for operations and security. Furthermore, senior level staff garner respect of the other members of your team. So by using those personnel in a pilot, you're more likely to have good assessment reflected across your whole organization. Secondly, expect to spend some time reviewing the experience early and to make sure that that experience does not turn negative. In other words, you want to expect to come away with both good and bad points, and you really want to make sure that there is a spin on that information so that it doesn't turn into misinformation within the organization. And then finally, make sure that you debrief to the larger community to extend the lessons that you've learned in the pilot. Some possible pilot programs might be, for instance, a, a new development project. Working security into the acquisition and requirement stage is a big change for a lot of organizations, but the advantage should be noticed and notable. Another idea would be an upgrade, an upgrade to an existing system that had been previously accredited will show how controls are inherited, perhaps requiring less assessment to implement or an experience on how to tailor controls. Finally, we suggest that you look closely at vendor tools that will help automate the RMF process. There are, of course, programs such as the DOD EMS which 
is an application designed to help an organization go through RMF, but there are lots of other tools on the market as well. I'd like to wrap up these slides with some key takeaways. The risk management program, or I should say the risk management framework, often involves the stand up of a risk management program within the organization. The risk management program will likely be that component of your organization that will deal with the information of threat and control information from all parts of the organization. But we do caution that one of the lessons many organizations have had is that it's a challenge to control that information and make it actionable. Number two is address pilots to help align your processes with the new RMF guidance. Our suggestion is that piloting is used as a means to inform the organization of what changes they need to make to both procedures and controls and to then take action based on those pilots as a means of informing the organization. The third item here has to do with speed or the cadence of the traditional prior security compliance programs. The expectation from RMF is that they will be stepped up, that the accreditation standard is not 36 months, but should be appropriate to the level of sensitivity of the data and the sensitivity of the system that's being addressed. So I wouldn't be surprised if many other organizations and agencies take up the mantra of the 18-month accreditation cycle. And finally, we recommend that you seriously consider automation tools to help build your risk management framework support program. This could be both for management of specific control areas or from the RMF process overall. Thank you. Hi, my name is Stephen Tipton, and I'm the Federal Systems Engineer here at Tripwire. The purpose of this part of the presentation is to show how Tripwire can help you meet the needs of implementing the risk management framework. So just to recap, the risk management framework is taken from this SP 837 guide, the guide for applying the risk management framework to federal information systems, a security lifecycle approach. And this has been available for FISMA compliance since 2004. The National Institute of Standards and Technologies, NIST, and the uh, Computer Security Resource Center, uh, CSRC, uh, put up this document to describe the transformation of the federal government certification and accreditation process into the risk management framework that stresses security from an information system's initial design phase through the implementation and its daily operations. It places equal emphasis uh, both on defining the correct set of security controls and on implementing them in a robust, continuous monitoring process. The publication uh, is the second in a series of publications produced by the Joint Task Force Transformation Initiative, which is a partnership of NIST and the uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the Department of Defense, and the Committee on National Security Systems to develop a common information security framework for the federal government and its support contractors. So how does Tripwire fit into this? Well, to go into that, I just want to kind of give you a very broad overview of what Tripwire does as a company. If you had to break it down, uh, what Tripwire does, uh, essentially what Tripwire does is that we gather data. And we gather data around things like change, configuration, vulnerabilities, inventory, and logs. And what we do is we take this data collection and we're able to put it into a business context that's easy to read and helps automate the processes around how to respond to that data 
and we will integrate with other third-party solutions such as firewalls, ticketing systems, threat analysis, uh, et cetera, to help you do something with that data and to accomplish your goals. As Sean mentioned earlier, for all of government, the risk management framework describes the process that must be followed to secure, authorize, and manage IT systems. Step one is to categorize the information systems. Step two is to select the security controls. Step three is to implement security controls. Step four is to assess security controls. Step five is to authorize information system. And step six is to monitor security controls. This helps define the process cycle that is used for initial security protection of the system through ATO, which stands for authorization to operate, and integrating the ongoing risk management through continuous monitoring. Let's talk about how Tripwire fits into this framework. And step one, categorize information systems. Uh, this is all about uh, understanding the organization. This step is typically all administrative. Uh, prior to categorizing a system, the system boundary should be defined. Based on the system boundary, all information types associated with the system can be identified. Information about the organization and its mission, its roles and responsibilities, as well as the system's operating environment, intended use, and connections with other systems may affect the final security impact level determined for the information system. In step two, select security controls. This is where Tripwire product suite uh, really comes into play. Security controls are the management, operational, and technical safeguards or countermeasures employed within an organizational information system to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the system and its information. Assurance is the grounds for confidence that the security controls implemented within an information system are effective in their application. Uh, Tripwire Enterprise, for instance, has over 900 different policies and can do over 28,000 policy compliance checks uh, based upon the required security controls. IP360 can be used to monitor for devices and be used to determine what vulnerabilities and what needs to be hardened from attack. Tripwire Log Center contains policy correlation rules for requirements like NERC, NIST, PCI, uh, DISA. It monitors events related to security control failures. Uh, a good example of this uh, would be an alert for when a service is stopped or login failures within a time frame, et cetera. Here you will see uh, just an example of some of the policy content in TE. Uh, as I mentioned, TE has over 900 different policy and does over 28,000 checks for compliance. Uh, here's an example uh, from, I think you see here, you see DISA, you see NIST, you see NERC and PCI. And so it's just kind of broken out for you here. This is an example of a risk matrix report in IP360. Uh, it shows how many vulnerabilities you have and which are the most concerning. Uh, those with automated exploit availability and remote privilege rank highest in the need to fix the issue. And we break this out so you know which vulnerabilities to attack first and to uh, prioritize your time. So if you look here in the upper right-hand corner, uh, you'll see uh, like 52 vulnerabilities. Those are probably your most immediate need that you need to fix while the ones sitting there in no known exploit and exposure, uh, 542 there are probably <clears throat> the ones that you can prioritize least. So what we really try and do here is help you uh, prioritize your time and make the most efficient use of it. Here's an example of some of the security controls in Tripwire Log Center. Uh, what you see here are some pre-built correlation rules uh, for NIST. We can also do it for PCI, DISA, uh, this is all for alerting purposes. Step three is implement security controls. Uh, the purpose of this is to put in the security controls and describe how the controls are employed within the information system and its environment of operation. Uh, Tripwire Enterprise and Tripwire Log Center really play well here. Uh, Tripwire Enterprise policies can be tailored uh, to each device to align with the required security documentation by using the system integrity monitoring capabilities in Tripwire Enterprise, an organization will have visibility to authorize and unauthorized changes to the environment.
uh, Tripwire Enterprise can be used to implement the security controls in conjunction with Tripwire Log Center for monitoring for the security control failures. Here you will see an example of security control policy in Tripwire Enterprise. Uh, the one highlighted here is an account lockout threshold. Uh, and so you can kind of just see how this plays here. Step four in the risk management framework is to assess the security controls. And uh, the purpose of this is to um, evaluate the security controls usually, uh, using appropriate assessment procedures to determine the extent to which the controls are implemented correctly, operating as intended, and producing the desired outcome with respect to meeting the security requirement for the system. A Tripwire Enterprise provides continual monitoring of the controls configuration and settings to report on the status of those security controls. Uh, Tripwire Enterprise can also be used to automate the remediation or interface with different third-party systems to create the necessary tickets to get corrective action. Uh, it really does check the systems for compliance to specific hardening guidelines uh, for your requirements. So here's an example of a Tripwire Enterprise and a, uh, assessing security controls. Uh, just a screenshot from a demo system that I have on my uh, machine. What you see on the left-hand side is a trending uh, graph to show you how you're doing in regards to compliance. On the right-hand side, it will tell you where you are in assessing that. How many tests have I passed? How many have I failed? Uh, and in an in tripwire environment, you can actually click on these and dive in and get more information to figure out how you're doing and what can be done to remediate it. On to step five, authorized information system. Um, authorized information system operation is based on the determination of the risk to an organizational operations and in assets, individuals, other organizations, and the nation resulting from the operation of the information system and the decision that this risk is acceptable. Authorized information system, we have reporting built into Tripwire Enterprise that's designed to work with POEM, the plan of action and milestones reporting. Uh, this provides the tracking and status for any failed controls. Tripwire Enterprise can also be used to grant waivers to failed controls, assign responsibility for resolution with action dates, and monitor the status of failed controls. In this slide here, I show an example of a compliance for use for ATO. Uh, what this here is, it's a, uh, it's a screenshot of a policy test that has passed. And so you can run these and show it and be able to present evidence that your system is authorized to operate. And finally, step six is to monitor security controls. Continuous monitoring programs allow an organization to maintain the security authorization of an information system over time in a highly dynamic operating environment where systems adapt uh, to changing threats, vulnerabilities, technologies, and mission uh, business processes. While the use of automated support tools is not required, uh, risk management can become near real-time through the use of automated tools such as Tripwire. Uh, Tripwire products can be used to provide ongoing security management and monitoring. This will help with uh, configuration drift and other potential security incidents associated with unexpected change on different core components and their configurations, as well as providing uh, authorization to operate standard reporting. Here's an example of using Tripwire Enterprise to monitor security controls. Uh, in a screenshot here, what I have is a side-by-side uh, -side shot of a change that was made. Uh, what we see here on the left-hand side is what we expect. On the right-hand side is what was changed. And we see the addition of a user to a Linux server. So we alert you to change. Here's another example of monitoring security controls with Tripwire Enterprise and uh, Tripwire Log Center. Uh, here we have them integrated where we can see a change that's detected by TE and log records that uh, tell us what happened and correspond to that change in TLC. Here we see a scoring report uh, from IP360. And uh, what this shows you, it shows you what your systems are the most vulnerable. And it's giving you kind of a prioritization list uh, of which of those nodes to fix first. Uh, IP360 uses a scoring system from 1 to 100,000 
to kind of just uh, give you a very granular approach to what are my most critical vulnerabilities that I need to address. You only have so much time within a week, and so you want to be tackling uh, the ones that have the most in impact. So to sum up, why Tripwire? Well, standards. It allows alignment of controls and language to improve the possibility of reciprocity. It allows you to focus on risk as a means to address diversity of systems, components, custom environments versus uh, uh, prescribing just a one-size-fits-all. It allows you to address security sooner by baking security into systems uh, versus just bolting things on. And for it provides continuous monitoring and roll-up reporting for just better overall federal enterprise security. The risk management focus will improve threat awareness and allow you to process the amount of information received, as well as uh, use automation to increase capacity, reduce dependence upon a single point of failure, and create improved sensitivity to the environment and improved reporting. So I'm including here just some additional resources uh, to the NIST SP 837 guide. Uh, there's the link there as well as our own uh, tripwire adjusting to the reality of the risk management framework. Uh, you can also do a search online for NIST SP 800-37 guide, as well as uh, do a search for uh, tripwire and the risk management framework. I'd like to also just thank uh, Sean Sherman for his presentation. And for more questions, uh, you can also uh, check out our website at www.tripwire.com. Thank you for this opportunity and have a great day.